clearly we disagree on a couple major points, but when we put that aside for a moment, we actually agree on some pretty significant ones as well, which I discuss in a video linked in the description. But this video will address our primary disagreement. Is salvation exclusively available to the natural children of Israel? Now we certainly agree that you're included, but let's follow 1 Peter 3.15 and revere Yehoshua as a Lord, always prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect, or as some translations put it, meekness and reverence. Let's go book, chapter, and verse, and lay precept upon precept, and if any Israelite brothers are willing to respond with their explanation for these verses and rebut with your own, I would be happy to address each and every verse you provide. Here we go. So first off, with Yahushua's own words when he was praying to the Father in John 17, he says, As thou didst send me into the world, even so sent I them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves may also be sanctified in the truth. Neither for these only do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me, and the glory which thou hast given me I have given unto them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that thou didst send me, and love them even as thou loved me." So while Jesus was specifically praying for the sanctification of Israel, he was further praying for everybody who believed on him. We can go to John the Baptist's words, quoting Isaiah in Luke 3, 6, saying that all flesh will see the salvation of God. This is quoting Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. The voice of the one that crieth, prepare ye in the wilderness the way of Jehovah, make level in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and every hill shall be made low, and the uneven shall be made level, and the rough places made plain, and the glory of Jehovah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken it. And we'll come back to what all means in a little while. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And he died for all, that they that live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto him who for their sakes died and rose again. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men. What is salvation? And I think this is the key definition causing all this confusion. Yes, there's always been a priestly group set aside. And yes, Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 14 talks about a small flock purchased from the earth that will preside over the earth. Jehovah's Witnesses have been preaching that for about 140 years now. But this particular honor is not the salvation that Jesus came to bring. We aren't lost to the priestly class praying for a priesthood to be restored. The sin of Adam and Eve was the rejection of God's authority and the benefits that came with it, namely eternal life in a world God made for us and made us for. Jesus was the high priest that gave the ultimate sin offering, see reference to in the description, not just to shake up which humans dominate which other humans, but to redeem us from sin and the death that naturally occurs by our separation from God, so that we can be offered the eternal life that God intended for us had Adam and Eve never sinned. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses don't teach universal salvation. Some will still reject God's authority and the life that results from it. But pause this, read the whole passage. It's beautiful, but there's a whole lot more to go through. And from Romans 6, we can get over to Isaiah 25, 6 through 8. He hath swallowed up death forever, and the Lord Jehovah will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for Jehovah has spoken it, and we know that his word won't come back void. This leads directly into Revelation 21, 4, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be any more. And then we go back to the beginning of Yehoshua's prayer to his father in John 17. Even as thou gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom thou hast given him, he should give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they should come to know you, the only true God, and the one whom you have sent forth, Jesus Christ. And we go back a few chapters to 637. It says, All that which the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And of course, Matthew 121 says, He shall be called Jesus because he shall save his people. I agree with that. And this particularly makes more sense in Hebrew because Yeshua is a shortened form of Yehoshua, which means Yehovah Yoshia. 
Thus, every mention of his name declares that he is the salvation God will provide. But his authority isn't limited to Israel. Not everyone will be priest to his God, as in Revelation 1.6, but all flesh shall subject themselves to his heavenly rule, out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. We go to Hebrews 2.9, But we behold him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor by the grace of God, he shall taste death for every man. Revelation 5.9 and they sing a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book, and to the open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and did purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe, and tongue, and people, and nation. And yeah, you know I'm going to go to John 3.16. Let's go up a few verses. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth may in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent not the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world could be saved through him. The salvation is life, not necessarily priestship. Yes, priestship can be exclusive, but life itself is for everybody that accepts it. That's what we mean by salvation. As far as authority goes, we can go to 1 Corinthians 15. And this verse is a little bit complicated, but very, very important. Starting in 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, since he was the first one resurrected. Then they that are Christ at his coming, that could be the elect. Then come at the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have abolished all rule and all authority and all powers. So yes, the nation of Israel is probably going to be the only nation that survives. America is not going to survive. Russia is not going to survive. All of the nations are human authority, and humans will have no authority in the kingdom because Christ alone will be king until he returns authority to his father. Uh, keep going in 25. For he must reign till he that put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be abolished is death. And 27 is really important. For he put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he saith all things were put into subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who did subject all things to him. And when all things have been subjected unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subjected to him that did subject all things unto him, that God may be all in all. Now this translation is particularly unspecific, but the point being that God will put all things in subjection to our king, with the clear exception of himself. After all of that is complete, after the thousand year reign, everything that was put into subjection of Christ will be returned to the exclusive authority of the universal sovereign, God. And then this leads to 2 Corinthians 5.19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not reckoning unto them their trespasses, and having committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And we go back to Psalms 22, 27 through 30. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto Jehovah, and all kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is Jehovah's, and he is the ruler of the nations. All the fat ones of the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he that cannot keep his soul alive. A seed shall serve him, it shall be told of the Lord unto the next generation. So again, everybody dies, not just Israel. Everybody who goes down to the dust shall still be able to bow before God in the resurrection. Then we go up to 86.9. All nations whom thou hast made shall come to worship before thee, O Lord, and they shall glorify thy name. Again, God made everybody, and everybody that God made will worship him and be in subjection to him. Then going back to talking about Jesus, John 1.29, it says, On the morrow he seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. And then 1 John 2.2 2 is very specific. Yeah, it's talking to the Israelites, but it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, the sins of the Israelites, but not for ours only, but also for the whole world. From there, Philippians 2.9-11, Wherefore also God highly exalted him, and gave unto him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of the things of the heaven, and the things on the earth, and the things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
to the glory of God the Father. Now this doesn't reduce Israel at all. They're still in a place of honor, and you'll be familiar with quite a few passages talking about avoiding Gentiles and going to preach to Israel first. For example, in Acts 13, and they absolutely did preach to Israel first wherever they went. But eventually, local Jews put them on trial and threatened them, and in verses 46 through 49, the ones who refused proved themselves unworthy of eternal life, and that salvation would now be preached to the outmost parts of the earth. Not just to Jews in Gentile lands, but the Gentiles themselves. This gets even more clear a few pages later that yes, Paul was going into Gentile lands seeking first the Jews in those Gentile lands, and I'm sure many did listen, but when those that were left opposed themselves and blasphemed, he proverbially brushed off his shoulder and declared himself clean. He had preached to them first, and their blood was on their own heads. After he had preached to the Israelites in that area, he specifically went on to preach to Gentiles themselves. And yes, we can see this foreshadowed in the Hebrew scriptures. Isaiah 49, 6, he says, It is too light a thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light unto the Gentiles, that thou may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And then in Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And this isn't just Hellenized Jews, they're talking to Greeks, so they're talking about Jews and non-Jews. They're using Greek here to describe Gentiles. And to use Jesus' words from Mark 12, Jesus defined the greatest commandment as the Shema from uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, which in Hebrew is Shema Yisrael. Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. Not only is Jehovah our God and the single universal sovereign, but the first two words of that commandment is to declare this to Israel, Shema Yisrael, to make Israel listen. And then Acts 28, 28 extends this. Be it known therefore unto you that this salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. They will also hear. So we're to declare it to Israel, yes, first, but the Gentiles are also to hear the same message. So then circling back to Romans 5, 12 through 18, so then as through one trespass the judgment came unto all men to condemnation, even so through one act of righteousness, the free gift came unto all men, the justification of life. 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator also between God and men. And since we've been to Revelation, we might as well go all the way back to Genesis, to a verse that I know that you guys hear all the time. And I will bless them that bless thee, and him that curseth thee I will curse. And that's true, a lot of people do overlook that part, but the part that other people overlook is the last part, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 22, 18, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Yeshua's birth was good news for all because it meant salvation for all people. This light for revelation to the Gentiles that were so far ignorant to God, and yes, specific glory to the people of Israel. Because this light had been revealed, the law could be our tutor, so even the ungodly could be justified through faith, and all things could be reconciled. Thus, Yeshua is the savior to all men of the whole world. This doesn't negate the law at all, but the law was never meant to be a shackle we should suffer. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So we should still follow the law and do still benefit from the law, because that's how we can serve God's plan and potentially store up treasures in the kingdom. But the first step is simply accepting God's authority, and salvation is the release from sin and therefore the separation from God, so that we can return to the life the world was intended to host. God has definitely chosen Israel but the entire Pentateuch shows Israel being given the law and failing and being judged and being redeemed and failing again and being judged and redeemed and failing over and over and over. The entire nation is just the personification of Romans chapter 5. But God shows mercy to all of his works, which is the entire world, and all of his works will eventually bow before him. All flesh will come to him of all the ends of the earth among all the nations. I look forward to seeing somebody's explanation for this. Okay, bye.